Good, good evening, evening, everyone. My name is Matthew McGovern. I'll be hosting tonight's event. It's a joint event with the Scottish Young Lawyers Association and Hey We Go. Now, the SYLA are a not-for-profit making organisation that exists to represent, educate and entertain young lawyers in Scotland. We've been in existence since 1974 and we represent all lawyers who study on the LLB, the diploma, trainee solicitors, newly qualified solicitors and advocates with up to 10 years post-qualified experience. It's a free organisation to join, it's a fantastic organisation. You can uh, get a lot of CPD and a lot of networking opportunities, so I thoroughly recommend that you join us. I'm very grateful to our friends at Hey Legal for hosting this event. Hey Legal are an organisation that provide virtual CPD for lawyers, a lot of good quality content, and we have a partnership with Hey Legal that if you join Hey Legal on the Law Channel, you receive a 50% discount and the SYLA get a profit of the sales. I thoroughly recommend that you do that. I know we've got a lot of students joining us tonight. If you've got an interest in criminal law, you would get a lot from Hayley Goose Criminal Law Channel. I thoroughly recommend that you do so. Now, we've got three fantastic speakers tonight, yeah, and I'm very grateful for all of them. I pause, half expecting you to be late. You said you were in hair and makeup. We was half expecting Mrs. Doubtfire to come on my screen, so I'm delighted to see you <laughs> in such good form. We've got Paul Mullins from Livingston Brown, we've got Kevin Corr from Graham Walker Solicitors, and we've got Lindsay Barber from McCusker McElroy and Galena. The three really good lawyers, I get on very well with them, they're very good in court and they're also very approachable. So if you do see them in court in the near future, please say hi, let us know what you think of tonight's event. If you've got any questions, right, there's a chat facility on YouTube. Now, first of all, Kevin's going to talk us through bail applications and I'm told by Kevin that he's got 100% success rate in bail applications. So no pressure, Kevin. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much for that, Matthew. Um, I would be interested to know what my currently remanded prisoners uh, across um, uh, Scotland's uh, institutions would be spitting out their coffee just now, I think, if they knew that I was um, taking on the role of speaking to young lawyers about bail applications. Um, but we are where we are, so we need to uh, move on with it. Um, so. I appreciate this um, is aimed at solicitors who are um, going to be um, appearing in court um, for the first time and uh, bail is one of, uh, if not the most important things um, that you'll deal with um, when you are appearing in court as a criminal solicitor. Um, the main uh, reason for that is, in effect, you are dealing with someone's liberty, it may well be um, uh, accommodation or employment or family, but everyone will have um, strong reasons why um, they will require bail. And clearly um, the situation can be quite anxious for um, the client. So it's a very, very important thing to um, uh, be able to deal with uh, effectively. Um, the first thing I would say in relation to um, uh, bail is, is simply to be aware of uh, the legislation. Uh, clearly, in this case, it's Section 23 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. Um, important to uh, be aware of the law, because ultimately what you're looking to do is to persuade the sheriff um, to apply the law in your client's favour. Um, so if you're looking at section uh, 23c it speaks about um, absconding or failing to appear um, significant risk of reoffending, um, likelihood of inter uh, interfering with witnesses or um, otherwise obstructing the justice process um, or any other relevant factor which the sheriff um, considers uh, justifies um, uh, refusing bail and um, the word bail in general can be substituted for uh, the word trust. Um, so um, an accused person will at first appearance um, generally plead not guilty to um, the allegations against them. Uh, and uh, they are presumed innocent, as we all know. So no determination in relation to um, uh, guilt or otherwise will be made at that hearing. The question in relation to bail is, um, can the accused be trusted at liberty um, whilst um, uh, the matter is dealt with. Um, one of the first things uh, 
that I think is important for younger solicitors to be aware of is that um, it, it's not your fault. It's not your fault if an accused person is remanded in custody. Um, these are quite um, anxious times and uh, an accused person might be disappointed if the sheriff um, you know, finds uh, uh, that they should be remanded in custody and sometimes that uh, can result in them you know, voicing their displeasure or whatever towards yourself. Um, they will in invariably tell you about um, difficulties we have, and I'm sure that Matthew, Lindsay, and uh, Paul um, have heard all of these. You know, you'll, I, I might lose my house if I'm remanded. I'm, I'm potentially going to lose my job. There's nobody to feed my dog or cat um, if I'm remanded in custody. I'm the only one that can look after my wee granny. Um, I actually, on one occasion in Ayrshire, had a client who had was remanded in custody and had a pet snake. Um, I am not necessarily a massive animal lover anyway, by no means an animal hater, but I'm not a massive animal lover anyway. I could not um, bring myself to have much sympathy for the pet snake. Um, but I, I say that um, because, um, you know, if an accused person is remanded in custody, then typically it will be because um, his record has went against him uh, if he has um, lots of previous convictions or um, the uh, accused may well be, if he doesn't have a, a bad record, he may well be subject to various bail orders, which again, um, if the accused is already on a couple of bail orders, then um, the, the court has to ask themselves whether they are satisfied that the accused can be trusted um, with bail uh, whilst the matter is being dealt with. Um, but what I would say is get your instructions from your client, present your bail submission as best you can, um, with everything the client wants you to say within reason. Um, and if it does go against your client, uh, I'm almost certain that it won't be your fault and you shouldn't take that home with you um, and uh, you know allow it to ruin the rest of your night, okay? Um, possibly, uh, I think one of the, the most important aspects of the job as a whole, not just in relation to bail, um, is managing your client's expectations um, uh, suitably. And where that uh, comes into bail is that um, you want to be going into um, the courtroom where your client will be appearing and you want to find out who the sheriff is that's on the bench. This is the person who will be making the decision. Um, some sheriffs, I will refrain from using names, but some sheriffs are better than others for bail. Um, so you, uh, you know, as you appear before sheriffs more and more, you will um, appreciate who the sheriffs are who are more likely to release your client in bail and who the sheriffs are who are a bit more difficult to persuade. Um, uh, the other thing you'll want to find out from the procurator fiscal is where, uh, what the client's bail position is, so whether your bail, your client's bail is opposed. Um, and if it is opposed, importantly, what are the grounds for opposition? Um, because these are, again, going to form um, uh, A, the basis of your um, bail submission, um, but B, uh, they will form part of your advice to the client in the cells before your case calls. Um, and, and that's absolutely vital um, that you go and see your client in the cells and, and just tell them if they have a problem for bail. You're, I mean, I think, and again, no names, but I think some lawyers fall into the trap of, you know, sometimes telling their client what they want to hear. Um, and not having the the difficult conversation with them, which is, um, you know, you have a, you have a real problem here for bail, and um, this is why the crown are opposing your bail, and you might not get out of custody. Um, and if you liken it, a bit of a strange example, but if you liken it to a doctor uh, perhaps giving someone bad news, and they say, look, you know, I've got some bad news, just to reduce the impact of the of the shock. What you don't want to do is tell your client. Oh, it's fine, you'll get bail, no problem at all. And then the sheriff refuses him when he's in the dock because what you're probably going to get there is your client's reaction from the dock, which is the last thing anybody wants. And um, so my um, take on that is that if you, you know, if you front up and tell your client, look, this is the difficulty you have here, then and then go and do, uh, again present the bail submission as best you can. Most clients will appreciate that because they'll they'll hear what the sheriffs are. Um, saying uh, and they'll understand that you've given them a good shout um, but as I said you've you've prepared them for the possibility that 
this might not go for you today. Um, so I think that's um, uh, that's something which is pretty important and, and probably um, advice that I would um, uh, that I would say uh, should be kept in mind. Um, the next thing I would say is, and this is specific to an experience that I had, is that there's there is always something to say. I mean, um, there was a case I dealt with when I was fairly new. Um, it was a bail submission for a client who had a terrible record and. Upon reading this client's record, I genuinely didn't know what I could say for him in support of bail. Um, and I had a conversation with a, a, a senior colleague uh, of mine at the time um, and explained to him, look, this is the problem I've got. I genuinely don't think I have anything to say to get this guy out in bail, but he thinks he should be out in bail. Um, and I, the advice I was given at that point is, look, tear through his entire record um, and find anything to say um, and there will generally always be um, something there and um, so things you want to be looking at are you know is your client currently on bail or on another order of the court like a deferred sentence or a community payback order and um, because if he's not on one of them then that's your first point he's not currently subject to a trust order of the court and um, the, the next thing you could look at is, okay, he's accused of certain offences. When was the last time he was convicted of similar offences? And if there was a slight gap in that, if it was a while ago, then again, this can help. He hasn't been convicted of something like this for a fair bit of time. Um, you can look at when the last time he was convicted of um, a contravention of Section 271B, which is breach of bail. Um, again, if he has either no contraventions of um, uh, Section 271B or it hasn't been for a long time, then that would always form part of my bail submission because you're essentially saying to the court, well, what what basis is there to suggest that this man can't be trusted with bail conditions if he has never breached them before or if he hasn't breached them for a long time? Um, again, you know, Section 271A, has he ever failed to appear at court? If not, this is useful because um, uh, you'll appreciate that Section 23, Subsection C, A, um, refers to failing to appear or absconding. So if he's not someone who has been convicted of failing to appear, then again, it goes to this idea that he can be trusted on bail to return um, to court when he is giving dates to do so. Um, are there any recent gaps in his offending? So he might have a massive record, but from 2012 to 2018, um, there was a period where he didn't come before the court before uh, for anything. And if that's the case, then you would want to say, you know, he managed a significant period of refraining from offending. Um, and that shows that he's someone who can do this. Um, a word of caution, I would always watch when there's a, a gap in a record of someone's um, uh, convictions that they weren't in custody at the time. Um, if you look at the one at the end, just before the gap, and make sure he wasn't given a you know, nine year jail sentence. So the, the sheriff's going to turn around and say, well, you say he behaved himself for four and a half, five years, but was it not just because he was in the jail? So watch for that. But apart from that, you know, if um, if there are gaps in offending, this is something I would put into a bail submission. Um, the other thing is um, an accused person's record will tell you if their um, offences were aggravated by being on bail. Um, so the wee box saying ag bail. Um, so again, you want to look at um, are any, uh, sorry, when was the last time he was convicted of an offence which was aggravated by being on bail? And again, if there's none there, or if it was a while ago, then what you're saying is, you know, he's not someone who commits offences whilst on bail, which is, you know, this ties into this idea of whether um, your client poses a significant risk of reoffending uh, pending um, uh, resolution of the matter. Um, has he ever had the jail? If not, this is brilliant because the you know the sheriff is then um, you know looking at uh, sending this person to custody for the first time, and that you know I think a sheriff will be more reluctant in, in normal terms um, to send someone to custody for the first time, and, and perhaps uh, uh, you know a bit less hesitant to do so if this is a person who's had the jail before. Um, if they have been um, uh, sentenced to a period of custody, was it recently? So if he you know had a um, eight month prison sentence in 2006 but he hasn't been in you know much trouble since then and hasn't been in the jail since then then you want to be saying well this guy's not you know this guy's not been in um, custody since then and um, 
if you are still struggling after those types of things to pull together a bail submission, then your client probably has a, a significant difficulty that he won't be able to overcome anyway. Um, uh, so uh, that may well um, take you on at that stage to his personal circumstances. So this is, uh, again, the house, the job, the unwell granny and the pet snake that needs to be fed. And um, that's when you would turn to that and say, um, uh, you know, these are the reasons why my client requires to be out on bail uh, and and leave it up to the sheriff. And um, I find that if you, you know, if you go through the, if you've managed your client's expectations by saying you've got a bit of a difficulty here, um, but I'll do whatever I can um, to try and get you out. You take his full instructions, you, go, you tear through his record to find um, little snippets that can assist your bail submission. And if you lay it all out to the sheriff, um, and it goes against your client, you, you'll tend to find that most clients, um, of, certainly in my experience, most clients will at least be happy with the effort that you have put forward for them, if albeit a bit disappointed at the, you know, the eventual result, which they will attribute to the sheriff, well, it's no fair that, I've, you know, I've been, I've been remanded, but that's fine. The, the, the point is that you've discharged your duty to them, um, and, uh, you know, as a result of that, you... Um, you shouldn't find yourself with with too many problems because if you're doing that um, then I think it builds a if you're managing your clients expectations properly even even if they are remanded then um, what what an effect you're you're doing is you're still building a bit of trust with the punter and um, because um, you know you've been honest with them and whether it's the result they wanted you have predicted that it was a possibility so you've you know that the client gets from you that you you know what you're talking about and if you know you're providing them with advice in relation to something else they might be more likely to to take that at face value um on the basis that you know you 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 know you know what you're dealing with essentially um so things that i think are are pretty important um i'm waffling on a wee bit i'm nearly towards the tank i think paul mullen might be up next i think his topic is karaoke but i'm not sure um uh but um the last thing i would say probably to finish off a, a, a veil uh, and there's probably in fairness there's probably a lot more that that could be said that, I, that i've maybe not had time to say but um the last thing i would say is that you you know listen to what the, the crown's grounds of opposition are um, and tailor your um, submission to, to account for that. So if the crown are saying that you um, uh, your uh, client has a terrible record, he's a significant risk of reoffending, then it's probably less important that your clients never fail to appear at court because that's not the basis upon which the um, uh, the Crown are opposing his bail. So you want to get into when those convictions were, you know, when the last time he was in the jail and what he's been doing, you know, since his last conviction. So you want to be tailoring um, your submission to try and counter the Crown um, ground of, um, of opposition. Uh, and I think that is possibly... Um, that's possibly my time in relation to bail. As I said, there's a lot more to say, probably not in 15 minutes, but if anyone has questions. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Go, go, go. Thank you. It looks, it looks like the um, the bail submission um, uh, CPD that's been given here is so um, overwhelming and so fantastic that members of Mr. Mullen's immediate family are, tra are trying to join Busting me. In. I'm going to take that as a massive compliment. Um, and I think at this stage, I might pass you back over to the host, Matthew. I'm happy to take any questions, uh, be it now or later. And as Matthew says, uh, one of the best things about this profession in general is the, the camaraderie. You are in court with your competitors most of the time, all of the time, pretty much. But I don't really get the impression that it's dealt with that way, and most people are happy to give advice. Um, so don't be stuck uh, with a problem. A problem shared is a problem half, etc. Uh, Matthew? Thanks, Ian. That was really good. And I think the key point you made is it's not your fault, and particularly at your beginning of your career, you can personalise situations and take responsibility but you always have to remain 
professional, keep that professional detachment from your clients' cases, right? Uh, that was a key point, that was a great talk. I'll pass you over to Paul. Oh, wow, I'm on. Nervous. Um, thanks, Matthew. I, um, I'm nervous to be in the, the company of such esteemed colleagues, uh, Kevin and Lindsay, as you can see. They're working hard. That's their, still in their office. I'm off on annual leave. That's my reason for uh, my working from home background. And Matthew is such a fighter for justice. He's in a Mariupol dungeon somewhere. <laughs> Hence the the background there, I take it, Matthew. That's well, good. I for a plus one to go to Putin's Moscow. So, Paul, if you're available, you can come with me. I'll do it. Let, let me do my... I've got the pick of the draws, you know. When it comes to talks here, um, I have to do procedural hearings. Wow! Um, I will try. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try and be um, the same length of time as Kevin was. I might struggle. I might have to fill it in with some karaoke. And if anybody knows me, I'll probably have to just do a quiz at some stage as well to try and get me to my ten to fifteen minutes. Feeling which we'll we'll throw back live to Maria Paul and uh, <laughs> then Lindsay can tell us. Um, I can't remember what she's got, but no doubt it'll be better than procedural hearings. Um, I should I'll introduce myself. I am Paul Mullen. I am a partner at Livingston Brown Solicitors. It's the only firm I've ever worked for, um, pretty much because nobody else will take me. And from doing my traineeship there, uh, I've just stayed in the one desk and uh, continue to, to work there. Specialising, if that's the correct word, in criminal defence work. I was get granted my extended rights of audience a couple of years ago, so I now appear at the High Court of Justiciary. And when it comes to procedural hearings, you'll probably all know, we have intermediate diets at the Sheriff Court and the GP Court and preliminary hearings at the High Court of Justiciary. Let me just say this, from having done multiple hearings at various courts, the general themes that they need to prepare for these hearings is, is exactly the same. I treat every hearing with as much respect as I possibly can. Um, and there's some fundamentals I'd like to go through this, this evening that if you follow should ho hopefully hold you in good stead, whether your hearing is at the Justice of the Peace Court whether it's at the Sheriff Court, a first diet at the um, solemn level or a preliminary hearing at the High Court. Three fundamental... It takes me back, actually, to when I was at school. We used to have this, this teacher that used to say... We, we used to make fun of him at school because he used to always say it is about exams. If you're prepared to fail, fail to prepare. Or maybe I've got that around the wrong way. If you've, um, but basically the key is preparation. Preparation, preparation, preparation. And with any case, you've got to know three things. Your client, your file, and you've got to know your court, know who your, your sheriff is. Kevin touched on it earlier on in relation to bail applications. Sometimes you just know when you go to court, you're not getting bail because of who's sitting uh, at the, behind the bench. And sometimes when you go down for a procedural hearing, you just know, you will just get to know who's going to be difficult. Not necessarily because that's um, the, the particular character. That's their job, really. You know, it's to try and iron out preparation um, and any wrinkles that are appearing in cases of problems, whether that be for the Crown or the Defence. So you've got to know your court and you've got to know um, what questions may arise. And if you're going to answer those questions, you need to know your file and you need to know the, the status of preparation. Intermediate diets at the summary level are, the full title is Intermediate Trial Diet. I suppose, strictly speaking, you should put as much preparation into this hearing as you do a trial. Realistically, you don't, but you've got to know your file. You've got to know what evidence is capable of agreement what are the issues in contention and what is your general approach to the trial when it comes for two weeks, whatever it's, it's going to be in due course. You've got to know um, what your line of defence is. And I used to 
when I started the, the old partner in the, the firm used to say if you can't put your defence down in two in a sentence, then it's no defence. And that I thought that was the best <coughs> one of the best pieces of advice I've ever had. And it's something again, just as my, my teacher at school is if you fail to prepare, prepare to fail line. If you don't know what your defence is and you can't say it in a line, one line, one sentence, then you're not prepared. Simple as that. Um, that's These are great wee nuggets that I really wish I had written down, but I have carried them on with me throughout my career and hopefully um, will continue to do so. So you've got to know your file. Um, you will be aware in due course, one of the key things that's discussed at intermediate diets, first diets, probably hearings is disclosure and there is an obligation on the Crown to provide the defence with the evidence that they will rely on to prove your client's guilt. And likewise, whilst you must be aware of that, you also have to have an eye on what evidence could be in existence that might be exculpatory to your client, such as CCTV, such as a DNA report that doesn't link him to whatever he's alleged to have done. So it's important not only that you look at what evidence has been disclosed, but look at what evidence isn't been disclosed because the procedural hearing is ideal time to raise that issue. There is nothing worse, I would imagine, for those sitting in the bench who at the trial diet, the defence raise an issue about preparation that was never raised at the intermediate diet. And it really puts you as a practitioner and your client on the back foot if a s issue of preparation is not raised at the earliest opportunity. And that goes back to knowing your file and knowing um, just where your defence is headed. And if you've got it, as I say, in one sentence, then you will know exactly where you want to take your defence. The third thing that I said about preparation was knowing your client. And that's absolutely key. Absolutely key. Now, if you're ever in a common room, whether it be anywhere in Scotland, you will hear solicitors uh, bemoaning their clients and um, various things. But it is so important to know your client. And I think the phrase that Kevin used was manage their expectations. So, so important. You've got to know your client's expectations and what it is they want to do with their case. At the end of the day, you are the person standing up in court, but it's their case, and it's important to them. It is probably the most important thing that's going on in their life, and appearing in court is a privilege, and it, whilst we could be appearing in up to 15 or 20 cases a day, it is an absolute privilege to appear for anyone in court, whether that be the JP court, the sheriff court, or indeed the high court, but... It's important to know that it is important to your client a lot of the time and just exactly calibrate exactly where their expectations lie. Do they want to plead guilty? Do, is this something that they accept that they've done wrong and they want resolved at the earliest opportunity? Because that might well be in their best interests. Section 196 of the 95 Act will afford them an obligatory discount if they want to plead guilty at an intermediate diet. So you've got to know what it is that your client's hoping to achieve or alternatively, um, are they wanting to go to trial? Are they absolutely 100% crystal clear in their innocence? And if so, are you ready to go to trial? Has your client had the opportunity to consider all the evidence against them? And for that reason, whether they're pleading guilty or not guilty, it's so important to get your client in probably about a fortnight to a week before their court appearance and just tell them the evidential landscape, engage what their reaction is to it and how they see the case unfolding thereafter. Procedural hearings are really about getting from A to B and what you've got to consider, what's the best way to get there and what is the best thing for the client? Is it the early plea maximising their discount? Or is it taking it to trial and arguing the, the, the toss with the Crown case. If you're guilty uh, an intermediate diet, it's, it's important that um, the client is well aware of what's going to happen thereafter. 
are they going to go to jail? And again, to, to echo something that Kevin said, you're as well to be honest with them and tell them, I think you're going to get the jail here. Or um, there is nothing worse as a young practitioner when you're not really sure. There's like this grey area and you think, oh, I'm no, I don't know what's going to happen here. And um, I remember early on in my career going up to see uh, this old lag in Berlin who asked me what he was looking at and I didn't know. I didn't have a clue. Um, and I just told him, I, I, I don't really know. I'll need to go and ask Mr Brown and come back to you. And I remember him saying, son, thanks for your honesty. You, you'll, you, you'll go a long way. Um, he was wrong, but he was right and he appreciated the fact that um, I hadn't tried to mess him around. There's no point. It, it, it wouldn't have done him any good. It certainly wouldn't have done me any good. If you don't know something, tell the punter, tell, tell the court as well. I, I was recently involved in a, a case... Um, it was a high court murder trial lasted for about eight weeks and I, I remember senior counsel standing up at one point and saying I, I don't understand that this procedure, I don't follow what's going on and I tell you something nobody thought less of him for actually saying that he didn't follow something, it will happen to the best of us and it will happen to the worst of us so please if you don't know something ask, ask somebody, that's the best nugget of advice I can possibly give you you're going to be surrounded by lawyers and you'll get to know lawyers love nothing better than passing on their own in information and their own intelligence so ask somebody there's no harm, absolutely no harm in asking somebody in general terms um, my some advice for starting uh, as, as I wrap up here uh, I can see Matthew just about to produce the hook and pull me off here I've got the um, Alex Ferguson injury time. <laughs> We're on Mulsow time. General <laughs> advice for appearing in court um, the first time, watch as much court as you possibly can. If your case isn't calling, go and watch other cases. I don't know if there's any students here that go and watch cases. If you do, fair play to you. If there's trainees there and you're down at court, go and watch other courts and watch out for copy what they do. I still do that. I still watch the the, the best lawyers. There's, we're really blessed, particularly in the defence side, with some really excellent uh, lawyers. I don't need to name them because you probably know who they are. Um, they, you see how they handle clients, how they handle difficult judges, how they handle difficult witnesses in trials. Watch them and copy them. And at the same time, watch out for bad lawyers because um, we have them as well. And that's not to be critical of anyone, but you will become aware of who just doesn't do the job often enough and who perhaps struggles from time to time. Watch out for bad lawyers and don't copy them. Learn not to be like them. Really, what I'm saying is a lot of this job is learning by osmosis. You borrow phrases from different uh, colleagues some phrases I really like, some phrases, I tell you a phrase I really, really hate, when somebody says um, a previous conviction is of some vintage, I hate that phrase, it really does my nothing, I don't know why, don't know why, but it's, um, we all borrow phrases from each other, don't borrow that one, borrow good phrases, borrow good habits, use them yourself and you'll, you'll be in good stead. And that's really... Um, I think all I can say, I, I did have stuff to go on and say about uh, preliminary hearings virtually, but I think now in 2022, everybody can use Zoom. So, you know, I'm not going to say anything about that. Maybe two years ago, that would have been relevant, but I think that's everything I've got to say. So I'll throw back to Matthew in downtown Ukraine. <laughs> Thanks very much, Paul. Thank I, you. I think your line about know your file, know your client, know your court sums up everything you need to do for preparation if you're to condense this event into one phrase it would be that it's a really good way to look at it it's something sorry that... if i'd known it was just one phrase i would have just said one phrase sorry matthew i thought you were looking oh, yeah, for more three times that. you just don't listen <laughs> hey, but if anybody is watching this and wondering how do you do the book for the first time that is as basic a rule to follow and you can't go far wrong if you do that yeah. um, now obviously i was delighted when this was a virtual event because it means that there's a only a very slight chance of Lindsay doing her best Will Smith impression throughout this talk, so I'll pass you over to her, who's in a separate location from me. Thanks, Lindsay. 
to be honest, I'm trying not to take it personally when uh, Paul just said lawyers that you've not to follow and not to copy. So I think um, the vast majority <laughs> of people here, um, particularly lawyers who use social media, will be massively aware of the trauma-centric um, mindset that is uh, very much at the forefront of a lot of uh, legal thinking just now and it sounds very obvious we are dealing with the most vulnerable members in society whether it is a one-off flash in the pan or whether they are prolific offenders whatever the rationale and the trigger is for the offending i have i suppose i was going to say the uh, the advantage but i've been in a number of sheriff courts all over scotland as an agent doing cases that I think ordinarily could be best um, described as hospital passes, where you pick up a file and you meet a client and it is their first time seeing you and you've got to convince them that you have a grasp on the case that may not have been um, at a stage or running away that you would do it. But the best advice I think I can give is befriend the clerks of court particularly if you are in somewhere like Glasgow or Paisley, where you have 100 clients with 100 files. If you check in with the clerks, they respect that and they know where you are and that you're trying your best to run your diary and not waylay the court. Because when you're chased down, there is nothing more stressful when you're first starting out and you're on your feet and somebody's trying to get your attention from across the court that you're needed somewhere else because it throws you and it detracts from the job that you are undertaking to do. Now, Paul is very slick and very streamlined, as is Kevin. So they're probably much more, Matthew's passable to be fair, they're probably more, much more streamlined at, at doing that than I am. But clerks control the court. They will call things usually to accommodate you um, if you just have the courtesy of checking in. It sounds, again, I'm full of very basic instructions today, but check the time that your case is calling. Some deferred sentences uh, will call at half past nine for a specific sheriff, and some will call at 10 o'clock or various other times. And in terms of pleas and mitigation, when you have had the opportunity to go over everything with your client and they want to tender a plea, there are a number of things that are just good practice eh, to get into the habit of. I always obtain written instructions from a client if they have or are tendering a plea of guilty. The reason I do that is you want to make sure your client has given you very express instructions, which sounds daft, but that they understand the possible consequences for them, whether that be... Um, that they're facing the jail or they have had a possible defence witness and they want to resolve matters because it keeps you bulletproof in due course. I'm not saying that to give anybody the fear, but sometimes clients speak to their pal in the jail who's obviously a very good lawyer in his own right, which is why he's in the jail, or you know their lawyer wouldn't do this or that, and it just becomes a bit muddy. So it's better to give yourself that protection. When you're at a stage where a client is tendered a plea and you're at a deferred sentence stage, you can often be in courts and you get several reports for several clients that morning. And timekeeping is often problematic for lawyers, let alone clients. And you're having to go over a number of reports with a number of clients that morning and make sure what is in the deferred sentence report is accurate. There's nothing that's going to harm the client that you need to clarify and similarly that there's nothing that they failed to tell you. Always check your client's address is still the address on either the complaint or the address that the court have. That sounds obvious but when you're on your feet mitigating, explaining the justification in the background for whatever they have accepted and you're having to go back over to the dock to confirm their address and to confirm that they've engaged with services and things or how much they can pay a fine back, it makes it look not as slick as it could, I think it's fair to say. So try and have too much information that you might not need as opposed to not enough. 
Um, a lot of the clients are in receipt of benefits and have other commitments, so you don't want to spread them too thin and not have that information for a sheriff. Similarly, if a client, um, you're dealing with a client at post-conviction stage and the sheriff is considering a restriction of liberty order and a client is giving you the address of his best pal whose surname he can't remember and whose address he can't remember, you need to check that because they could be giving you an address that either doesn't exist or that they're not welcome at. And then you get into the territory of having to do multiple bail reviews and multiple other things, which if they're just clarified at the time could save you and everybody else in the court a fair amount of, of work. A lot of clients um, are that we deal with, again, are not necessarily working for a variety of reasons. There are substance abuse problems. As I'm sure a lot of you will know, there are the, uh, there's the Drink and Drugs Court in Glasgow, which sounds much more fun than it actually is, with specific sheriffs who will deal with clients who have a systemic history of substance misuse. That's very, very helpful. If you think your client is going to be suitable for either of those or both of those, you can ask for that assessment so that we can hopefully begin to improve their circumstances with regards to that. And the sheriffs will then keep an eye on them for the length of any order if they're deemed suitable. The sheriffs aren't expecting miracles overnight. They are expecting some difficulties Christmas time is usually very very difficult or bereavements or any other number of things but it is a very very good service that is available to people and it certainly is something that should be utilized if your client is somebody that you think will be appropriate for the those courts what is um, something to be aware of and this will only come um, with experience is that clients will often come up with a number of uh, situations and circumstances that they think will help them not get the jail. For example, um, my partner's pregnant. Some of those pregnancies can um, be the equivalent to an elephant pregnancy where this child never materialises because they're pregnant for months and months and months. There's also the favourite um, excuse or position at the moment, which is my mammy's got COPD. And for some reason, they have to help their mammy with the shopping or up and down the 27 flights of stairs in the high flats. And they've been in custody for years. So their mammy's gotten by for a period of time without them. And that sounds very flippant, but you need to be very careful with what you hear from the client and what you tell the sheriff. COVID has been, call me cynical, but a, a good excuse for certain people not to come to court timiously if they think they are going to get the jail or they've slept in or they just would much rather be somewhere else in the court. If you're saying something to the sheriff that you genuinely believe in good faith with a duty to the court and your client, you must be ready to evidence it or to vouch it. You can say the phrase, I am instructed, which is effectively a wink and a nod to the bench that you're told this but you maybe have your views about the veracity of the statement, but you make it anyway because it's your client telling you what you have to do. And a really, really good bit of advice, in fact, I actually um, said this to Kevin's colleague, Abby, who's not long been appearing, is that when you are in an NQ, it's daunting. You're not used to it. You are overthinking everything. Can I tell you that nobody's listening? And I don't say that to be condescending. I say that because they're only listening if there's a problem or your guy is kicking off in the door. We are all over to have files. We're all, when we're not on our feet, trying to figure out what court we should be in next and where our client is in the building. So as much as that might um, not be lovely for you to hear and you're expecting it to be 12 angry men, it's usually just one angry man usually on the bench so ask if you ever need help and um, there's a lot of sarcasm there's a lot of inappropriate humor and some relatively decent puns on occasion but nobody will see no but maybe not Paul's chat but nobody will see you stuck and um, we've all been there every day as a as a learning curve in this job there's something or a different view and um, but 
ask. Um, and the sheriff, the court will give you time. If you're on your feet and you're thrown by something um, and you feel that you've got to have the answers, you don't. Um, and just remember that at the end of the day, we all go home at night and somebody else's liberty or somebody's job prospects or travelling to America with a football team, there's a lot at stake for them. Um, if it's a serious offence and they've never been in bother before, the reports process is, is massively important and we don't get involved in that. But it doesn't do any harm to suggest to clients that if they're sorry, they maybe say that to the social worker. You would be surprised how many uh, reports, criminal justice reports you see and people don't say sorry. And, and that saying sorry goes a long way to the court. Um, and that may sound very, very obvious, but it does um, help. And I mean, I, um, I I think that we're very, very lucky in terms of the people around at the moment who are regular um, solicitors in courts are honestly so approachable. You can text, WhatsApp. I'm sure there's probably some lawyers out there on TikTok, but um, yeah, I can't work that yet. Um, but by all means, approach us because we've all been there. You know, at the end of the day, we are there to help people. And sometimes you can lose sight of that because it seems quite frustrating and you know there are a lot of changes, but it is a job that when you're doing when when you're enjoying it and you're having a day where things have gone a certain way or you really do actually feel that you've made a difference, there is legitimately no better feeling. Um and Matthew and I do Josh, but he's he's relatively competent. Um and I'm sure that my um, back's payment is on its way. But I'm in Paisley, the boys are in Glasgow or Hamilton, and you can just message there's literally no such thing as a daft question given what's at stake. Um and I think that's relatively everything that I wanted to say. It's quite nice for me to be able to uh, just sweep up what the boys have said. But I'm on, obviously, LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, and you can just message your way if you need any assistance. Cheers, Matthew. That was great. Thanks, Lindsay. And I think your point about it's important that there's a difference between what the client thinks is a good point and what the sheriff will consider to be a good point, and it reminded me of a deferred indictment I did, I think it was three Fridays ago, where the offence was very serious, it was deferred for reports, the report was so bad I printed the client off a copy for him to read, and uh, we went through it, he said at the end, what day is going to happen, I said, I think you're getting the jail, and he goes, oh, I can't get the jail, I've got, I've just picked up messages, I've got milk and fish in the house, and uh, notwithstanding the fact that there was a half pint of semi-skimmed milk and two pieces of cod available to the sheriff. He gave him 18 months. Um, so always be careful. You don't just regurgitate what the client thinks are good points. Yes, you have your instructions, but you have to give them advice on what's appropriate and what's not. Now, they were three really good talks. We've got some time for questions. If anybody's got questions, put them in the chat. But the question I was going to ask all of you, just how do you deal with a difficult sheriff? And I mean, don't be under any illusions. A lot of sheriffs are very, very supportive, they're very encouraging, very, very good to appear before, but you always get difficult sheriffs and, uh, not to use any names, but imagine there's a difficult sheriff who doesn't know the law, doesn't get it right, and maybe used a phrase that a previous convictions of some vintage and in a few years' time you're appearing before Sheriff Mullen. Uh, how do you deal with a situation like that? I'll start with you, Paul. Oh, you're on mute. Paul, so you're not, not only was I muted, thanks for that. How was I meant to hear that? I'm muted when I'm muted. Um, <laughs> sorry, my hearing was muted as well. I couldn't hear what you asked me, Matthew. Sorry. Or oh, so I was just asking how you deal with a difficult sheriff. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, there, there's no easy way, obviously, because they are difficult sheriffs. Um, I think, in fairness, you've just got to stand there and deal with it. I was going to say take it. I don't know if that's the right language to use nowadays. I, I remember, um, I can say this, you know, oh, no, no, three out of the four are now retired, but my first Christmas uh, with my gown, still stayed with my mum, and I was the duty lawyer in Glasgow, and the four custody courts were presided over by Sheriff Mitchell, Sheriff Ronnie Watson, Sheriff Baird, and then Sheriff Ray. And 
I remember going home, boxing night, and saying to my mum, I, I, I don't think I want to be a lawyer anymore. <laughs> um, it, I mean, I, I say that there are, I don't think there are any sheriffs who were as demanding as those sheriffs were. I, I might just be old guy talking now. Um, I, I think the, the new raft of summary sheriffs are all um, a lot more user friendly for court practitioners. Um, but I, I do think back to that and think it was difficult. But what you have to remember is difficult sheriffs make you better lawyers. And whilst you might not appreciate it at the time, whilst you might want the carpet to open up and just let you disappear down a hole, doing trials and appearing before sheriffs who ask you difficult questions will make you a better lawyer tomorrow. And in answer to your question, what's the best way to deal with it? The best way to deal with it is listen to what they're saying, answer their questions as best you possibly can, and learn from the experience because it will stand you in good stead and will make you a better lawyer tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And if you're not learning in this job, if you're not learning in any job, you won't enjoy it. And it should hopefully stand you in, in good stead for the next day because I, I don't know about anybody else. I I think I've still got another 25 years of doing this job. So I would hopefully improve, maybe not day on day, but year on year, I would like to think that I could could get better. I was getting what about you, Kevin? Um, I, I mean, I, I get what um, what Paul's saying there, and I, I think I, I adopt his position in relation to if they are, you know, if the if the sheriff is giving you a difficult time because um, you know there is a legitimate, you know, difficulty with your file, you're not ready, um, and it's you know it's fear that you're getting a bit of a difficult time, then. Um, I would always um, try and apologise and, um, you know, take ownership of it. I mean, the, the last thing a sheriff who has given you a difficult time legitimately wants you to do is to try and, you know, go around the houses explaining why this happened and it's no your fault and it's somebody else's fault and the dog ate your file and stuff like that. Like the, the sheriffs are too wise for that. Um, so if... Um, there has been an error if you've been late into the court or whatever. Um, you know, I try and start by um, apologising to the sheriffs for any inconvenience that have been caused, um, and to you know, to to show the sheriff that I'm I'm aware of the fact that there's been a problem. Um, I will and try and ensure that it doesn't happen again. I'll try and minimise um, uh, you know, inconvenience to the court. Um, but I suppose there's you know there's another time when you might take the view that the you know the difficult time that you're getting is maybe not because there's a difficulty with the file or you've been late it's you know it's maybe that that you know the the, the sheriff is uh, perhaps reacting disproportionately to something and in those circumstances i think firstly remaining you know composed you know you're going to have a discussion with the sheriff but you don't want to you know if you know look Lose your, um, lose your, lose your temper. Hold, hold on a wee minute. I've got a streaker. Hold on. I hope it's not Paul. Uh, <laughs> I think we all uh, hope that. Paul, Paul, Somebody Paul, was Paul. doing the dishes earlier, Kevin. Who was that? Well, that that might be the missus. I think you said cooking. the round. <laughs> I think she was cooking my dinner, but I suspect. Oh, brilliant! Suspect it. I'll might come be, round. It might be cold now, but. Um, Yes, yeah, so I, I, but I think remaining remaining composed, obviously, um, you know, this is a sheriff, it's a person of authority. Um, and the other thing as well, you know, the, 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 there might be a, a kind of disagreement with a sheriff in relation to one specific matter, but remember that this is a sheriff that you will have to appear in front of again and again and again in respect of different cases. So if you, you know, if you end up souring a relationship with a sheriff and then, you know, three weeks later, you've got a deferred sentence where it's borderline jail or community payback order. You are relying on this sheriff to follow your um, submission that the client should get a community payback order, but he might have in the back of his mind, well, you know, actually, I remember, I remember your, um, uh, you know, what your solicitor was saying a couple of weeks ago. So I think, st I think standing up for yourself is, is fine. And I think most sheriffs will, will appreciate that if you feel like, you know, you're, you're getting a bit of a hard time, but um, you know, if if it is if it's legitimately your fault or your firm's fault, 
then front up, you know, accept that, that you've caused inconvenience to the court, apologise and try as best you can to ensure it won't happen again. And most sheriffs these days, you know, will, will appreciate that, I think. No, I think that's really important. I think there's nothing worse than hearing a submission of, I don't know, it wasn't either prepared this case. At the end of the day, you're on your feet and you're far better placed, holding your hands up and being honest and you get a lot more credit than trying to fudge it and then having to concede the point anyway. Um, what about you, Lindsay? Despite anybody who knows me when I'm not on my feet, less is more when you've got a sheriff who is kicking off whatever the reason and again it never it's never easy but it gets easier if a sheriff is simply wanting to run often the sheriff is actually ranting or using you as a conduit to make a remark to your client that it may not be appropriate for them to say directly and it's you know so they'll say Mrs. Barber you know they'll use your name and they'll suggest something and you know that it's actually going to your client and you're just there, as it were. And it sounds very, very daft, given the job we do. I know a lot of lawyers, when it comes to remarks made to them by the bench, we hate confrontation, which sounds daft, because all our job is, is confrontation. And it's egos sometimes. Sometimes it literally is. Believe it or not, sheriffs are human. And sometimes, you know, they can be irked by something, they've had a morning of it or something else. And it's usually not personal. If a sheriff is being disproportionate or excessive, then there are mechanisms in place for lawyers to have informal discussions and advance anything if it's needed. But to be honest, it really is just stay measured, don't volunteer too much information and just try and deal with it as appropriately as you can can in the circumstances because the profession is there and they'll have your back. Thankfully, it's not something that happens overly often. Yeah, I think that's a key takeaway for all. It does happen from time to time. The overwhelming majority of experiences you'll have in court are positive ones and it's a place where you can grow and develop on a day-to-day -day basis. We're kind of pushed for time, so we'll try and fit in a couple more. Just a question about bail. When the bail application is almost unstatable, are you better simply moving for bail and saying to the sheriff, notwithstanding the difficulties my clients are in, I have instructions to move for bail, or are you better being honest with the clients saying you've got no chance? I, I know that's an issue that young lawyers struggle with from time to time, so I want to know what the panel's views are. i start with you, Lindsay. I think, to be honest, if you're instructed um, and you've had the dialogue with your client, even if it's completely and utterly hopeless, um, you know, you you have to make the observations because the fiscal will address the sheriff about the, you know, various reasons that the bail is opposed. And if there's no ESTO positions, you know, so if there's no special conditions that would allow your client to keep their liberty, they'll know because they're usually a prolific offender or there are such extenuating circumstances that there's not a hope. But if you, again, the phrase I am instructed is in, you know, I know really that competently there is no no possibility or very little possibility that is the sheriff saying that they appreciate that you have probably had the dialogue with your client about the realistic prospect but that they still want bail then you have you have to do as you're instructed unless it's stupid or illegal um, and your client with a if they've got enough of a record where it's not really justifiable but they still want it it's just going through the motions unfortunately we've all been there um after you know very frank discussions but you have to do as you're instructed yeah that'd be my view too i take it paul kevin you would take the same view or would you have a different view i can see you both nodding yeah I, 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 again it goes back to what i was saying about managing expectations like you know you go down you speak to your client and you say to them there is no chance there's nothing i can say that will get you out in bail and some punters again the more reasonable ones and the ones who sort of you know have been around a bit and um, might say right don't bother moving for bail then in which case you know you don't move for bail others who might be a bit more unrealistic will say no i still want you to ask so as lindsay says you, you take down the the full instructions you make the submission and um, and it will you know in those circumstances it will likely be refused but you've already told your client this is going to be refused you haven't said it's okay i'll get you out because that's when you're going to have problems Absolutely, we're now at 7 o'clock, so I'll just go around the panel very quickly. 
if somebody approaches you in their first day of being in court, what's the one bit of advice you would give them? And if I can start with you, Kevin. Um, it's, do you know, I think Lindsay might have actually stole my thunder on this as part of her um, talk in relation to pleas. And it was when she was talking about Clarks um, and befri befriending Clarks. Um, it, it's a thing that my firm just now are particularly struggling with and the guys who've been in Glasgow will, will probably be aware of that. We are quite, we're probably quite understaffed just now for the work that we have, so we're stretched a bit about the, the court building and it's causing cases to sometimes call at the same time. And, you know, as Lindsay says, if you check in with all your clerks and explain to them that you're in different courts, they can hold things back for you, explain things to sheriffs, um, and they can also do you favours if you've, you know, if you're in a jury case and you need your case to call sharp, you know, you can explain that to them and they'll bump you up the queue so that the clerks can can really have a massive effect on your court day. So stay on the right side of them. They can have the they can have the negative effect on your day if you upset them. And um, so they're certainly not to be upset the clerks. Um, and they, you know, if you can get them on side, your day will be much easier. And Lindsay? Network. Um, it's really good. Just the the profession, some pretty good banter going about um, and we're all just fighting a battle every day and we're all in the same boat and I think there's nothing better than chatting to other people about a funny case or something useful that you'll take an adage from and there are so many avenues of communication now as well that you shouldn't ever be stuck. Sometimes I think when you're starting out, um, if you're particularly appearing in the same jurisdiction all the time, you don't really want to ask questions that might seem really obvious if the partners of your firm or somebody's about. Um, and it's better to have a slightly more removed connection to ask what you might think is a really daft question, but you'd be mortified to ask internally. Um, and we're all very, very approachable, uh, so or mostly. So I think that's key. Um, that now you know we can be as communicative with each other as we want, and it's quite a good feeling. Paul, I'll give you the last word. Thank you. I would agree. That's enough. Him. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> so you said word that I didn't realise you actually <laughs> meant what you, one word. Very quickly then, what Lindsay and Kevin said is absolutely spot on. Um, I'll try and quickly say, talk about nerves. I had um, immense nerves when I first appeared in the Justice of the Peace Court um, in St Andrews Street all those years ago. I had... Um, Amazing amount of nerves the first time I appeared in the High Court of Justiciary. But listen, um, it's not about you. You need to just push them to the one side. Your nerves will not help the client. You've got to be there to serve not only the client, but the court. So, uh, yeah, it's naturally her nerves, but you've just got to push them to one side, push on and, and get the job done. You're a professional at the end of the day. That's my advice. Okay, I'll finish with mine. See if you're on your feet, if you feel the cases are getting away from you, you don't know the answer. Just ask for it to recall, take instructions, take advice. No sheriff will have any difficulty with that. And as I say, Lindsay's right network, we're all online, we're all quite approachable. You can see Paul's tucked into his dinner already. And can I say thanks very much to our three speakers, they're fantastic talks. Right, thanks to Hay Legal for hosting the event. And please check out the Scottish Young Laws Association and he legals criminal law channel. Thanks very much and have a good night. Thanks, thanks for having us. Cheers. Right, thank you. Thank you.